Uh, welcome to my talk on for the Dapper Day. This presentation will talk about how my team is able to process a ton of data points daily using Dapper. Before we deep dive, a little bit about myself. My name is Srivarma Vegiraju, currently a software engineer at Microsoft. I'm a freelance contributor and love hiking as well. This is my LinkedIn and email. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or suggestions regarding the talk, or if you want to talk about Dapper in general. Coming to the agenda, we'll first talk about the business problem we are trying to solve. Then we'll look at the architecture we had before Dapper, what did the infrastructure look like, and what were the complexities we were running into, and why we were looking outside. Then we'll look at a bit of overview of Dapper, and then we'll talk about how Dapper changed our architecture what our infrastructure looks like right now, and then uh, how it simplified some of the processes. Then we look at what are, this, what are the things we learned as part of DAP, Dapper migration, what are the gotchas we ran into, and what are the subtle nuances we had to, be, we had to keep in mind when working with Dapper. Finally, we'll talk about what's next for us. We have started with one building block, how do we plan to incorporate some of the other building block that Dapper provides us and make our architecture more resilient? And then we'll conclude the talk. So coming to the problem statement, my team at Azure is responsible for protecting, network, protecting Azure workloads from network-related threats. And how we do that is by, provide, is by recommending secure rules to our customers so that once they apply it, their infrastructure starts becoming resilient to any network-based attacks. Now, what do I mean by rules and recommendations? Let's, ta let's take a small example to explain this. Many of us who are working on Azure have familiarity with virtual network. It is basically how you control your traffic to the services behind it. For example, in this case, I have an app service and I have a virtual machine. And if I want to control what traffic gets into my virtual machine or app service, I can apply rules at my VNet. The, the rules here can be your ingress and regress rules, and the VNet would only allow anything that is compliant with those rules and block the rest of them. The snippet of what you see on the right is basically an example of one such rule where we are allowing any traffic on any port to communicate to the backend. Of course, this is broad, but the rules that are applied on the prod are more stringent. Now, in order to even apply these rules, we have to understand the team's network topology. And when I say network topology, what kind of rule, what kind of uh, systems the team is talking to, and then what kind of services they are depend on, are they talking to internet and so on. And in order to process this network topology, we further have to uh, process millions of events daily, which will enrich the network topology. So to summarize, we want to protect Azure workloads from network threats by processing millions of network events daily and showing the teams their network topology. This is what we want to solve. Now let's look at the architecture we had before Dapper. What you see on the left is the source data store. The millions of agents sitting on the virtual machine send data to the source data store where all the uh, network, data, network telemetry sits. Now the store, data store is a blob storage, which is part which has data partitioned on an hourly basis. What the ingestion engine does is, because the data is partitioned on an hourly basis and each day has 24 hours, it puts 24 markers into the queue. And then the aggregation infrastructure pulls the marker from the queue, goes to the corresponding partition in the blob store, starts downloading each file. And once it downloads the files, it enriches it with some metadata and puts it into the destination data store. And then we have an API sitting on the destination data store that would expose the network topology to the users. 
A quick summary. So there's a source data store, which has all the network telemetry data, which is partitioned on a hourly basis per day. The ingestion marker puts the, puts the hourly markers into the queue. The aggregation data store pulls the files from the partition under the source data store, enriches it with metadata, and puts it into the destination data store for the APIs to consume. Now, to understand the problem a bit more, let's look at what the aggregation engine here does. Coming to the aggregation engine, once it pulls the record, the first thing that it does is it fetches the number of files under the partition. Second, it fetches from which file it has to resume processing. For example, let's say there are 10 or 15 files under the partition, and I have to start processing from the sixth file. It gives me that information. Then I also do a aggregation at the VM level. So this file contains telemetry data of maybe 10 or 20,000 rows, and each row represents a VM. I aggregate the data at the VM level. And for each VM, we get this uh, VM metadata, which talks about which service this VM belongs to. Then we get the service details, which, which tell me if the service is prod or non-prod, if the service is Gov or public cloud, because rules change depending on this. And then we ingest that information into that destination data store. Now, I told you the source file itself has around 20,000 rows, and after aggregating at the VM level, there might be eight to 9,000 VMs, right? Let's imagine the pod dies after processing four or 5,000 VMs, right? So we have done the fetch metadata calls for four or 5,000 VMs, and then the pod dies. Now, when I restart the process, I again restart from the 0th VM again. This is the problem we had. So because we were starting at the 0th VM again, again we have to process all the API calls for all the 8,000 VMs. Now, as the system is growing, we saw that 20 to 30% of our network calls attribute to this duplicate processing. We wanted to reduce that. That is the first thing. Second, what we see here are the three steps, fetch metadata, fetch service detail, and ingestion. Now, even though these are three steps, for us, they belong to one atomic unit. That means even if one of the step fails, we end up restarting from the fetch metadata call again. Again, there are redundancies here as well. And if you are able to reduce it down, the advantage we would achieve is we are able to boil down the 20 to 30 percent calls we were seeing, and then also increase the efficiency and delays in the system. So to summarize, two problems. One, because we were not resuming from where we failed, we were running into uh, we were running into a lot of duplicate processing. Second, each of our workflow also does not resume from from the failure point. So these are the two problems we ran into. Now the first thing that comes into my mind to solve this is what if you are able to resume at that particular VM we failed. For example, let's say we have processed the two thousand VMs, and if you are able to resume processing from the 2001th VM, we save all these redundant calls. And that is where we were looking for some solutions. Now, building such a checkpointing or a state management system is not easy because what would that involve is I would have to determine what the state management schema would look like I would have to determine the data store. I uh, data store I have to use, and then transactions. Uh, how would rollbacks be there? And then uh, observability. 
So building a state management engine and maintaining it is a multi-month effort and also it's an additional operational constraint. What we were looking for is, are there any existing out-of-the-box solutions that give us these management capabilities? Second, what we also were looking for is, because we are already running on AKS, Kubernetes, are there any out-of-the-box solutions that come support with the Kubernetes environment? These are the two requirements we had. And when we started researching, that is when we found out specifically about Dapper and then Dapper workflows. Before we deep dive into them, let's look at the actual infrastructure we had before Dapper. So here, what we see is the uh, AK, all, of our, all of our services de deployed in AKS, and we, have, we use the Azure storage to store our blob data. And then the pods start pulling in from the queues and then goes to the actual storage to fetch the, uh, to download the data. Next, we have the metadata service, which gives us all the metadata required and put the data into the Azure Data Explorer cluster. Finally, I, I also mentioned we resume file processing from the previous uh, we resume file processing. That metadata is stored in Cosmos DB. And all of this authentication and then is done to manage identities. Before we deep dive into how Dapper Workflow solves a problem, a bit of overview. Uh, Dapper Workflows, as I believe, have three main components. One is the Workflow SDK, which you use as part of your app to curate Dapper uh, to curate Dapper workflows and activities. Then you have the Dapper sidecar, which your workflow SDK communicates with. And then the state store, or, and then the persistent store, also called the state store, where the Dapper workflows store all the state that belongs to a particular workflow. Now, some of the constructs in Dapper workflows. So each Workflow is divided into workflows and activities. One workflow can have multiple activities. And how it achieves uh, resuming state is through event sourcing. Basically, what instead of taking a snapshot, it maintains an append-only history log of events. And, when, and the golden keyword here is await. Whenever you await an activity, Dapper offloads all of the uh, history to the state store. And once the await task is complete, it from the state store, it gets the history, builds the world, and then starts resuming. That is what uh, the workflows do. And coming to the patterns, uh, Dapper, uh, the workflow patterns are multiple. There is fan out pattern where using task.venall, you can uh, you can put out, you can schedule multiple workflows at the same time, or task chaining, where you have, where you run activities one after the other. So the golden thing that also solved us was event sourcing because that is what we were actually looking for, where we were able to resume from the previous failure point. Now let's look at how our previous aggregation workflow changed once we incorporated Dapper. So we first started with integrating Dapper with our aggregation infrastructure, because this is where much of complexity is. And we continued to use Cosmos TV as our intermediate store. I think this is where we should have done some more better. I'll explain why that is the case. So coming to the aggregator, uh, coming to how the aggregator was itself modified. Once we pull the record, we kick off a parent workflow. Now the parent workflow, the input to the parent workflow is the partition uh, it has to process. And then it, there are two. There are two activities first. 
first is the one that down that gets the count of files under the partition and the second is the one that retrieves the previous state until we have uh, done the processing for this we use the dapper save state api to uh, resume and sorry use the get state api to get the state from where we have processed previously then we download the file, do the aggregation. Here, what we do is after we do the aggregation, remember we have mentioned we do aggregation at the VM level. That means there are 4,000 or 5,000 VMs. For each of them, we schedule a child workflow. The child workflow has three sub activities again. The first one fetches the metadata for the VM, second one, the service details. Now, for the ingestion, the input to the child workflow is the aggregated data itself. So because the aggregated data is present and all the metadata is present, we do the ingestion also in the child workflow. One more benefit we receive uh, with using child workflow is we are able to keep the state, uh, the parent, we are able to keep the history uh, replay history for the parent workflow pretty low. That is one advantage we had. <clears throat> and then finally, once the child workflow returns, what we also do is save the progress we made into the saves, uh, save the progress we made into the state store using the save state API. So a quick recap of what we have discussed. We have one parent workflow. The parent workflow has two activities. The first activity gets the count of files in the partition, and all the second activity retrieves the partition, retrieves the state. Then there's a child workflow that is scheduled to fetch the metadata, service details, and do the ingestion. And then finally, we we do the save state API. This is how our workflow changed when we incorporated Dapper workflow and activities. The advantage we also receive is because the parent workflow saves the state uh, saves the ongoing events whenever we do an await. In case of failures, since the input does not change, we are able to resume without making any IO additional IO calls or scheduling those workflows. That is the advantage we also received. Uh, coming to the inputs and outputs to the workflows and activities, as I mentioned before, the input to the parent workflow is the partition name uh, that it has to query. And to the both activities, we pass in the partition name. All these are strings. And, and, and then we get the file name. This returns as a list of objects. Then we do the aggregation and to the child workflow, we pass the aggregated object. The aggregated object has the VM ID, which pulls in the VM details, service details, and using the aggregated data, VM plus service and ingress, we ingest the data. Coming to the code, uh, let me explain by showing the code directly itself. So this is how our code looks like. So the network record input has the partition name. Now, when we, the first activity that it does is get the blob partition record count. So number of records under the partition. And then the last process record. Assume if there's a workflow, let's assume there's a pod failure here or there is some other kind of failure. Because the partition name does not change, Dapper is able to replay this from the state store and get me the output without make, uh, scheduling this activity again. Coming to the uh, processing itself, once so here we download, uh, we pass in the file name, then we get the list of records back here and then we do the aggregation here. So this is nothing but VMID and this is the aggregated data. And then for each 
VMID, we call the child workflow. And when we call the child workflow, we pass in the network data. And if you look at the enrichment workflow itself, there is again call to the service metadata and then security exception activity to get the exception details. And then we, we pass all this information to the data ingester activity. And once we get that back, we use the Dapper state sort to save the activity we made till now. For example, if there is any failure here also, because the VM, the object does not change, we are able to achieve a minimum cost when recovery and make our workflows faster. Going back to the presentation itself. Now, how our infrastructure changed once we in incorporated Dapper. So because we are using AKS, we installed Dapper with the AKS extension and we down, uh, all of this is deployed using the bicep template. And then the template itself, the extension also installs the sentry placement and inject a Dapper sidecars as well. Sorry, so, uh, install the sentry placement injector uh, containers as well. And then all of this is pushed to Prometheus and then to Grafana. Now to talk with the state store, the managed identity, we use Dapper uses managed identity. This is where we had one more learning where when we use when we have to use managed identity, the authentication takes a bit more of time and the Dapper default timeout wouldn't work and we had to increase the timeout. Fine, and then coming to the learnings itself. First, smaller workflows are better. The reason being uh, because of the event sourcing pattern, all the events are recorded, and if, if the parent workflow has ton of activities, what would end up happening is every time it would have to, when it tries to construct events, when it tries to construct the world from the events, it, uh, it becomes a little tricky. Second, understanding the state store limitations. This is what uh, we were caught a little off, off guard. The reason being, Cosmos DB has a 5MB limitation of the request. And we saw that two to 3% of our workflows, when they were running into issue, that is when we found out that, okay, this might not eventually work. So we are planning to migrate, do some migration there, but I wouldn't say this is the end of the world. The reason being, Dapper abstracts away the state store implementation details beautifully. Now, the, the thing you have to change is most probably the state store YAML file, which switches the Cosmos DB to Redis or something. And none of your workflow has to change or the code has to change. Everything Dapper takes care of. And then the constructs of using workflows and activities, and more fundamentally, all your service invocations are recommended to happen through activities because of the inherent advantage that if the input is same, the activities wouldn't have to be scheduled anymore. This is, uh, so these are the constructs we had to keep in mind when designing Dapper workflows and activities, and it was a very good learning for us. Coming to the North Star, we have started with uh, aggregation infra, aggre integrating Dapper into aggregation infrastructure. Now the next steps are, from the inherent pattern here, we see this as PubSub. So the, uh, we believe the Dapper PubSub building block will be a beautiful fit into this architecture here. And then the Dapper service invocation API is also something we are looking for because the inherent nature of cloud workloads are they are you have to have retry mechanisms built in because there are transient call failures. And one advantage we get is Dapper Sidecar already has this logic to handle all these has all this retry logic. Second, 
uh, it also helps you restrict the access policy by placing access policies that which API, which containers can invoke which APIs. So these are the restrictions that also I can use. So the North Star would be uh, looking into how we can invoke, incorporate service invocation API and the PubSub APIs. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, this is uh, this is what our Dapper journey has been, and it has simply been amazing. And uh, with all the stage store management capabilities, we saved months of effort building such capabilities and observability infrastructure, and uh, add more business value in a short duration. With that, I wrap up my talk and hand it over back to Mark and Cecil. Thank you.